Welcome to the bottle workshop. Super, super excited to um, have everyone here. We are going to be going through this bottle evidence packet um, because I think that it's important if we have a tournament not only on the 17th, but we also have a debate that's happening after um, the afternoon break uh, that we understand what's in this packet, what's going on, but more importantly, even from that, what does it mean to be affirmative and what does it mean to be negative in these debates? So take the, the model of this, yes, will have a PowerPoint presentation. We'll also show you all, depending on which side you are on in this debate, uh, which evidence to highlight and how to effectively highlight um, the evidence. So we'll have some time to do that uh, during this workshop to ask questions. I also provide a model for how you should go about effectively highlighting, um, just because I think it's a really cool tool to have. You do not have time to highlight every single word in every single card. And if you do, you have done something that I could never in my 10 years of debate. And so good, good kudos to you. But if I am assuming your humanity, you cannot. And so I'm here to help effectively uh, create strategies for good highlighting. Um, but yeah, so some of them, I think only one person will look at this and be like, hmm, some of this is familiar. It should be because only a few of y'all have come to the JV Varsity Bottle Practices. And so that's why I am bringing it back with a few extra twists. And then also two of our volunteers, I'm so appreciative to have you all um, to help lead this um, workshop presentation to help students. So whenever y'all want to filter in, provide some insight, insight even on the level of like a debate argument or just more information that I'm, you know, missing, which is likely uh, about um, I. So um, we are going to start with the affirmative side of um, the packet and this presentation has two roles. One is to introduce thematically, so just kind of what is the organization of being affirmative, and I know some of my JP Varsity folks are like, I know how to be AF, but as something that I've seen, and not only in coaching middle school, high school, and college folks, is that sometimes bringing it back to the fundamentals, regardless of your um, skill level is always helpful to build on what the foundations you have already to nuance them make them more complex and just understand debate in a deeper way so we are going to return back to the fundamentals to add more words and insight um, into how you understand being affirmative and then the second application will be applying it to the packet one thing that i did forget to do um, but it will be more kind of me just talking um, and why I say to have the packet out in front of you is the uh, a answer to um, the negative off case positions. I realized in the negative presentation, I talked to them about them, but I don't really talk about them on the app side. So after I introduce the negative argument, we'll kind of bring back some of what are what is the AF controversy to what the negative is saying so that when you have these debates um, after the break, you're not like, okay, so where do I stand here? What's going on? And we'll make sure that you have an idea um, to how to engage um, these arguments. All right, so that's the order. We're gonna get into it. Um, here we go. So Objectives. Students will be able to identify what socio-cultural values influence how affirmatives are created, evaluated, debated, and defeated. We have to remember that debate is not just a document or it's just, you know, something that is not affected by people's lifestyles about the ways in which they've been raised, the ways in which they've been taught how to learn, and therefore how they've been taught how to understand debate and judge debate. And so these implications very much so affect the ways in which debate operates, but also how you can understand your communication style and what is being received um, in rounds. So that is the objective for the first part of being affirmative. 
sociocultural, you probably were wondering what the definition of that was, and so we provided it, uh, is that it is related to the difference of groups of people in society and their habits, traditions, and beliefs. So very similar to what I just said, right, that we're all kind of brought into the world differently, or some of us have some commonplaces in the ways in which we have raised that can be controlled by culture, can be controlled by the society that we um, have operated and can be controlled by the family structure, the different belief values that we have. And so all of those things combined are a socio-cultural um, element. And really that's just the groupings of people that are uh, very much affected by culture. That's the socio part of society. Um, so yeah, making sure you're taking notes, but also this is in the bottle drive. So you should have access to these PowerPoints always already. And I would very much so suggest to return to them when you're going back to your notes going, what, what, what was that last sentence? The last sentence is in the drive. All right, so what is the socioculture and policy debate? Debate is a culture. Uh, um, it's a long history of not only argumentation, but people in debate. Um, people in debate are who transform the activity. They are who lead to new arguments, but new um, acceptances of arguments and the ways in which debate is evaluated has definitely changed throughout the years. And so those transformations and changes all point to a very hard fact, not hard and like, you know, it's, you know, two ear, ear, ear encephalobox, ear, oh, words are hard. Ear, rin, sec, uh, but you know, the word I'm trying to say, y'all, words are hard, I'm tripping over them, but that it's a hard fact that we cannot kind of negotiate out of, that changes are built by people, and so what are we doing in this activity, and how do we kind of engage in those changes, and that is because different groups of people who make up debate, we've got UDL students, such as yourselves, uh, local circuit. Um, if you, I went to a school um, when I was in high school that did Chassa, uh, and so I did a lot of local tournaments that were not derived by UDL, um, but also were not national circuit. There's the regional circuit, so now we're grouping it based upon different areas in a state uh, that have tournaments, and then there's the national circuit. That which transcends state lines and does all of national rankings and competitions uh, that allow for you to engage with folks uh, across the country. There's NSDA, there's an entire like debate around uh, national circuit versus NSDA, the different tournaments and the different folks who are in charge of those two national um, areas. Uh, but once again, sociocultural, different kind of ideologies that are reinforcing these different groups. Um, and that these groups can be further broken down into race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexual orientation, and geography, where debate is filled with different types of folks. And so different types of folks and perspectives have entered into the space and have made the space what it is. And so then there's traditions of affirmatives. Now, the acronym, it's funny, yeah, and we're gonna talk about it and break it down in terms of S-H-I-T-S or I-H-T-S-H, whatever way that you don't wanna look at the acronym and how it states, but how debate kinda has made it so is that it's solvency, harms, inherency, topicality, significance, um, and the ways in which affirmatives are oriented through that structure and negatives are oriented to understand how they defeat uh, the affirmative. And the lastly is habits of the affirmative. So what is the majoritarian opinion? Um, and is it that all affirmatives must have inherency, significance, solvency, and harms? I would go another level and say that there are different types of ways of affirming. And what are those different types of ways? How are they accepted? How are they viewed? Does it affect how people create paradigms on tab room? tab room, uh, something that we'll talk about a little later on. But all of these things are because not everything is understood, dealt with the same way because we are all different people coming from different backgrounds and different kind of cultures um, are happening in this activity. So uh, what is the gen generic understanding of S-H-I-T-S? -S? Um, we will get into that. I will say, some of this, I'm not 
it's not as though I'm moving over it too quickly. It's because I'm going to return to it uh, on the negative uh, portion of this as well. But we will tackle um, kind of generically what these all mean because I'm assuming in JV and varsity that you all have gone over the SHITS. And so it won't be too brand new, but I will kind of quickly map it out. So the first is significance. How significant is the problem of the affirmative is trying to remedy through um, their interpretation of the re uh, resolution, right? So the affirmative has an impact, right, in the debate. Is that impact important? Is that impact something that, if not resolved, has a grand, without saying impact again, but has a grand effect on society or the affirmative has implicated slash they have talked about it so much and detailed it to a point where it's we really don't want this impact to occur a lot of bad things happen from that and that is why you should care about the ability or the affirmative solving that impact no important impact no no reason to care about whether or not the affirmative solves or not the impact very much so controls the significance factor of the 1AC. You don't have a, no impact, you don't have a 1AC. You just have something that solves a thing, but no importance for why solving that thing um, means anything that we should care about. Next is harms. What happens if your plan doesn't pass? Why is your plan needed right now? And sometimes this can be conflated um, as Huh. It can be conflated with significance. And so once again, this is why I break it down even further um, on the negative side, but even I had a slippage. Significance, not necessarily, it has a relationship to the impact, but it is not the impact itself. It is the relationship that the affirmative creates with the impact to say that the affirmative, right, exists during a time where something really bad could occur. And that means that we need to do the affirmative. The affirmative has to build up its kind of bigness or its kind of substantive um, significance, if you will, um, in order to create a reason for why we should not only buy the impact, but why we should buy why the affirmative is the affirmative we should take up to resolve that impact. How big is the AF? Is the AF important? Can the AF get the job done? Why is it this AF in particular, right, that is the best way at resolving the impact? That is significant. The harms is the literal impact. And what happens if we don't pass a plan? Now, what is guaranteed? We don't do plan. What is, what is the thing that takes place? Inherency. Um, what is inherent in the status quo that prevents your problem from already being solved. All affirmatives have to be inherent. If you do not have an inherent 1AC, we have a problem. Let me explain why. The resolution always says that the United States federal government should um, do something. In the context of this resolution, that the United States federal government should enact a substantial criminal justice reform, right? In one of the following areas, sentencing, policing, forensic science. And so that should does not, would not make sense if the plan is already happening. You feel me? If the F is happening in the status quo, should no longer makes a lot of sense because it just is. Should provides or is pressed upon the idea that it's not happening in the status quo right now. And that is a problem. And the app is making a justification for why we should live in a world in which this plan is passed. Uh, a word maybe that y'all are familiar with and maybe give me like a, a Zoom hand is fiat. How many of us have heard the word fiat? Give me a, yeah, celebration emoji. We have, I need a few more reactions. I got a thumbs up. Any, any other any other reactions? Uh, I'm not gonna call names, but we're such an intimate little group that I can call names without see reactions. Is Fiat something that rings a bell? Catherine? Mm, mm -hmm. 
no, that's perfectly fine. That's why we're here so that I can make sure that I am not talking about things that you're like, okay, I'm gonna pretend like I know what you're saying. So y'all, this is a good example of message or stop the presentation and be like, no, what you have just said, you have assumed that I know and I don't know. Help. So that's what we're here for. Um, fiat. Uh, promote or uh, Harrison, do y'all want to talk about this? I don't want to make sure that I'm not talking um, too much. Um, but if y'all want it to, you definitely can um, to break down what fiat is. Sure. Uh, so fiat is Latin for let it be or something close to that. And the idea of fiat in debate is that the activity of debate is imagining that the affirmative plan has passed and now the affirmative gets to say the world is better because the plan is passed and the negative gets to say the world is worse because the plan is passed. And it functions as a way to prevent devolving into debates about like, well, this senator from Ohio won't vote for it because she's up for reelection in next year and like all this stuff like will Congress pass this piece of legislation? Will they, won't they? And that's just not an educational or fun debate to have. So fiat exists to just say like, ignore Congress and the fact that they're dysfunctional and won't get shit all done. And let's just assume that it happens. And now the debate is, is the world better or is the world worse? I, that's a great summary, Harrison. And uh, I, I think exactly what he said, it's to try and focus the debate more on the substantive issues, such as what Jasmine is talking about, the solvency, the inherency, the harms, and get away from kind of the, what's called the political or legislative process that might, might exist. Um, it's obviously different times and places to discuss those things, but for policy debate, we kind of want to focus more on the substantive items, and fiat is a way that helps us get away from you know, the process arguments and more talking about the substantive items. Yeah. Not that knowing the legislative process isn't educational or important, like as informed citizens, you should know that, but in this activity, it just wouldn't be fun or educational to like get into line by line staffing, stuff like that. 100%, thank you all for that. Um, and that they covered it. Um, debates would get nowhere uh, if the uh, didn't. Mm. So from a critical mindset, I say that I put that away for a second. Debates would get nowhere if fiat did not exist um, because it would no longer, it would just be, oh, your plan wouldn't even happen. All right, next. But it's like the app has made so many arguments um, that we should debate or engage in what if this plan did pass? What are, is that able to solve for this impact? That is where debate actually exists, where disads and counter plans compete at the level of that if you're just like, nope, that plan would never pass, so I'm not even gonna debate this. It's just like, okay, so we're not even gonna respond to the resolution of should. You're just like, if, and the debate's not if, it's should this plan happen. Not if this plan happens, if the plan does happen, should it? Uh, so yeah, perfect. Does that, uh, Isaiah, uh, does that helpful or understood? Give me a little Zoom, react, Catherine, Zoom, react or verbal? Okay, perfect, awesome. All right, so we're going to apply it to the packet. The JV Varsity Affirmative this year is Abolish ICE. Um, I put it together um, as the Varsity Packet, but circumstances have made it so that it is both the JV and Varsity Packet. So um, that is why we have arguments like critiques and counter plans um that are going on but i thought it would be really good to kind of start moving bottle in the direction of having more things to uh say beyond case debate and disads so yeah i'm super excited for how this year is going to go with that um and that's why this workshop is so important to discuss so um now that you know more about being affirmative let's apply it to the bottle evidence packet. Um, the objectives for this portion is that students will be able to identify the parts of an affirmative with the bottle packet. Second is that students will understand the distinction between the burden of proof and the burden of rejoinder. Three is that students will be assigned to highlight that one AC and have it prepared by next practice. By next practice, I mean this debate that's coming up in like an hour and a half. 
So, and we'll provide you the time to do that, so don't worry. And also we'll kind of give you an idea of how to effectively do it. So yeah, those are the objectives. So topicality, there is not a topicality argument uh, in the current uh, evidence packet just because um, to, to move the debate, not move the debate, but I just didn't find a utility in having it for the time being. I might do a supplement or I change my mind at some point. That's the beauty of online um, debate is that we can update and add and send out. So it's something that I will think about, but it's important at the level of understanding why affirmative being topical is a position that the affirmative must have. So what part of the resolution does the plan meet? Is it topical? Does it abide by the resolution? Here is the plan text. The United States federal government should defund and disband immigration and custom enforcement, ICE, um, and the areas are sentencing, policing, forensic science, substantial and reform. These are examples of words that T would potentially um, say the affirmative, not, not that this affirmative would violate, but the affirmatives violate, and they would define sentencing or define policing in a way that is exclusive, which means that it does not include the affirmative uh, to say that it violates the resolution and that because the negative came prepared to debate an affirmative that abides by the resolution, that the affirmative should not be evaluated. T is kind of like the gatekeeping argument that's like, if you're not topical, this debate should have never happened because only F affirmatives that reside underneath the topic are ones that provide a equitable debate for both sides to engage in that is uh, fair and also deep. Um, and so that's what the negative would say to this, but also what affirmatives, when they're putting together their topical apps, because I would be remiss if I did not say that there are strategically untopical affirmatives and that those do exist in debate and, you know, they're just as substantially valuable, but the debate looks a little different um, and T looks a little different in these debates. But for an affirmative that does attempt or want to be topical and T is red, um, this is what the negative could potentially say. And so what part of the resolution uh, does this plan text um, meet? And this is me asking you all a question. Read the plan text. Does it meet sentencing, policing? Is it a substantial reform? Is it a reform? What are y'all's thoughts? I'm gonna start calling on people. I'm not afraid. I think it pertains to policing more strongly than, than the other two. Okay. And it seems pretty substantial. And well, whether it's a reform or not, I feel can be a little tricky, but I would decide that it is a reform. Okay, let me let me return to the substantial. Uh, why do you say it's substantial? I'd say it's substantial because I, although in the total realm of policing, maybe not as much, but I still think that because it's such a prominent issue and, you know, with them being in the news and whatnot and doing all these things, it'll have a pretty big effect because, yeah. So you're saying the pervasiveness of ICE as like, it as a, is it the impact that it has? Are you saying it as a program, right? When you're saying substantial, because this is from a negative perspective, something that potentially could um, happen is that is the affirmative substantial in the effect that ICE has in society or is it substantial in that the program in, in and of itself is large um, and that making a reform there would be a substantial change in a program or policy in the uh, government. So what I would do you say think that fits? I would say more so in effect, but not exclusively. Okay, and um, just so I want, excellent, thank you for um, those add-ins. And I, I agree that probably policing has a good part of it. I would also argue sentencing um, because the way in which um, this would happen is that the agency would not only be disbanded, right? but that the kind of role of ICE enforcement is that it allows for um, undocumented immigrants to be put towards criminal charges in which that allows for them to be kind of like 
they get detained into prisons or jails and that jails can hold them for a certain amount of time for ICE to come to collect, uh, to, to bring them to a detention center. And so that might have some relationship to, are we, is it allowed to sentence or to, um, yeah, to sentence very small and mm, it's arbitrary civil offenses as criminal ones that justify automatic deportation, right? Like that would be something arguably right, would be the effect of abolishing ICE because there would no longer be the precedent for detainment um, or at least um, insidious, and by insidious I mean there, ICE doesn't really have many regulations as it currently exists uh, to, to get to, to take folks, to bring them to detention centers. And if they, if a undocumented immigrant were to violate at the small level a crime and even them being undocumented already puts them in a criminal offense um, that the maybe resentencing or the changing of the law at the level of what is a civil offense uh, potentially would um, change slash challenge that process. So I would potentially argue that sentencing also maybe a little less forensic science um, but that would be my take. Uh, Harrison, Pramod, do, you, Pramod, do you agree slash some other words on that one? I would agree. I think also Nuriel's, uh, this promote, I think Nuriel's uh, mm -hmm. observation is an interesting one that you can also use for topicality discussions, you know, where you say abolitionment is not a reform, and then that tries to draw some sort of a bright line between, you know, what is topical and what is not. Because generally when you're in a topicality discussion, you're always trying to present an idea of what is and what is not topical that's easy to identify, not just for the debate round one is in and the, the affirmative that's being run, but if you look at kind of the entire spectrum of cases that could be run, you know, how does um, the topicality argument being made limit the cases that could be run not only in that round, but other rounds as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some of those bright lines in Ariel raises one is, are there, there are different ways to create arguments around topicality. So that's a good observation, I thought. No, excellent. I wasn't looking at the chat. But thank you, Darielle. That definitely, and that will be a debate um, for apps that do abolish this year um, as to whether or not that is a reform because they don't leave intact some part of an agency. Um, and that their argument is if the resolution wanted us to abolish programs, it would have said abolish. Um, but then affirmatives, you know, will make the argument that it is an agency, it does not get rid of the entirety of you know, CJR, and so therefore, or not CJR, but like uh, all criminal uh, legal systems. And so therefore ab abolishing one program as a reform to the entire system. Is it in, uh, an argument that affirmatives that choose to abolish will say, or they'll just have a very, and I think that, uh, who was it? Who was I just dialoguing with? Was it you, Max, who I was talking to about the uh, policing and sentencing and substantial? Yeah. Perfect. Um, that the whole idea of substantial being in effect, right, that ICE is bad um, and that we should have these discussions that abolishing a program versus reforming this program has substantially no value or substantially no value in that it is because of the effects of ICE that the only reform that could happen uh, would be to abolish it. They probably would also include um, a literature argument that uh, abolish ICE is not a new idea, and that is part of when we talk about reform um, embedded in this idea of abolition, so that one, they would make a current event slash already in legal conversation, abolish ICE is understood as a reform, not as much as a complete overhaul abolishment of like an entire uh, system program, et cetera, et cetera. So there's different interesting ways that T shakes down, but something, and, I, and I'll bring this up slightly in the negative, but since we're doing it here, I'll just take notes to not spend too much time on it when we go to the being negative. Um, just, to say one, just to say one thing on what Jasmine said. Yeah. So ja Jasmine's saying is a, is a really good argument in topicality debates, which is that, well, this is already in the literature and considered a type of reform, or it's so prevalent of a topic area that, the negative team you and any other team that's debating this topic would have known or had an expectation that this type of firm is going to be discussed or ran. So there's really no harm to the negative team 
Um, so there's no reason why you should vote on topicality just for, just for the sake of topicality because we're still gonna have a robust substantive discussion, which is really the goal of the topic. And topicality is really just to make sure that people aren't really going so far outside those boundaries to discuss something that people wouldn't be expected to discuss and doesn't become a, a, a fruitful conversation for everybody. So there's a lot of different ways to discuss topicality, kind of fairness, you know, very good debate. These are all different factors that you can bring into the argument of why something is topical or not and why a judge should vote for topicality or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, um, Pramod. Um, yeah, T. <laughs> um, next. Inherency. Stop. If your app is happening in the status quo, you got a problem. Um, is the plan likely to occur right now? We got a problem. If the plan is happening in the status quo or it does not have enough obstacle or pushback to it happening, you are not reading an inherent 1AC. This will likely not occur too much because um, inherent, it has just been in, indoctrinated in the minds of affirmatives that they need to be careful about knowing that their affirmative is inherent. But it's important to know that if you do spot an F that is A, already existent, or B, has not, this not have a large inherency threshold, i.e. that if the plan is on the docket to pass right now, and let's say just like current news, which is why it's important, which is why sometimes affirmatives, if they're reading a very kind of hot button F, um, that has the likelihood at some point being resolved during the year that let's say for example, like um, the app on the national circuit topic or an example of one is to decriminalize um, and legalize uh, use of or marijuana, right? Um, and like, let's say during the top, during the time of this resolution, this app is keeping to be debated out over and over and over and over again. But then for some reason, um, the government decides to pass that, to say that in its totality, that the federal, at the federal and, or just the federal level, that marijuana is legalized, decriminalized everywhere in that states um, should not or cannot criminalized on the basis of um, use. That this would make the affirmative that is very much so close to that decision sad, because that means that they have to jettison, move on, new AF. Um, so yeah, making sure that you keep up to date with the topic. And a lot of the time, sometimes the topics aren't germane to the politics that's, that's, that's happening right now. And that's sometimes selected on purpose. Uh, so that the topic doesn't change as much. But we have a topic that is on the docket of conversations right now. So my uh, recommendation, even if, you know, I, I do not think that ICE will be abolished um, in the, the year to come. I don't think that's likely. But if in fact it did, I will be sad because I have to put together a whole other, now I'll, I'll be happy, let me, let me rephrase that. I'll be very, very ecstatic but very, very like, who okay, new AF packet because you can't read this anymore because it's passed. Um, so yeah, inherency is really important. Uh, and so here is an example of inherency in the 1AC evidence that you all have. Uh, is there, op Oop. okay, sorry. Is there opposition? Um, the line says that though ICE abolition is spreading on the left, it quickly meets extreme skepticism elsewhere. In part, this is because the mainstream political discourse is a huge blind spot for the agency's increasingly brutal policies. While elites have generally become concerned with rising authoritarianism, they have mainly ignored the purges ICE is conducting in immigrant uh, communities and that centrist pundits have dedicated thousands of words to the threat of PC culture on college campuses, but haven't found time to question whether an opaque and racist deportation force might pose a larger threat to democracy than campus editorial pages. So this is an example of like inherency. One, ICE is not abolished. We all know that. So already in our minds, we're like, this is an inherent 
pro an inherent problem that should happen, but this is evidence every affirmative must have to show some level of opposition or skepticism to the plan passing. Solvency. Here is the 1AC evidence for solvency. The plan's mechanism is to disband the agency. Uh, Trump's deportation squad should cease to exist. Immigration enforcement as we know it should end. What this means in practice, a moratorium on deportations, the end of all forms of immigration detention. We need to establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to examine the abuse perpetuated by Homeland Security agencies. We need rep reparations distributed to the millions who have been terrorized by ICE. The mechanism of the affirmative would result, would result in, one, the act is disband the agency. Disband the agency is described and explained through the following things, and that was the moratorium, that was the end of all immigration detention, and the Truth, uh, the truth and Reconciliation Commission in terms of reparations. That would be kind of what is the plan's particular way of abolishing, and that would be disbanding the entirety of the agency with all those things encompassed. Um, harms. I don't know why I have the T there. You know, we live our best life. It just kind of happens. Uh, um, was there someone with a question? I hear Mike. Um, okay, back to the solvency. How would you respond to arguments that would like say that instead of ICE, there's going to be an even worse system? Well, that's not really a solvency argument. Like that, that's like a either a circumvent. It is a solvency argument, not at the level of does the affirmative disband ICE, right? Like the argument or question that you are asking is what could potentially replace ICE? Not that the affirmative's plan would not happen, right? Or that not not happen, but that disbanding the, or not doing the mechanism or the mechanism in and of itself is insufficient to solve. Um, but we will get um, into on the case neg and case affirmative stuff later on in this particular being AF's uh, presentation, um, some insight on those circumvention arguments because it is very true, right? That, all right, we get rid of ICE, what replaces ICE? Are you saying that nothing will, that all of a sudden we have a comprehensive immigration reform slash um, empathy towards citizenship um, because we abolish an agency? Oh, we don't? Then what's to say the thing that comes after is not worse, et cetera, et cetera. And also, does the way in which the affirmative disband the agency, one that provides some potential pushback to these new programs, right, being able uh, to be constructed. That's a debate uh, to be had on the very specific way in which the affirmative calls to abolish ICE. So partially answering your question, but also saying it's to come. Yeah, and if I could just jump in for a second. Yeah. Um, that argument that in the affirmative world, ICE goes away, but then like ICE 2.0 comes in and is even worse. That's more of an impact analysis argument. And so that's the plan happens, like Jasmine said, right? Fiat, the plan happens. Now the negative gets to discuss is the world a worse place? And if worse than ICE comes along, obviously the world's a worse place. But then you have the four methods of analyzing impacts being in numbers or quantity. So worse ICE deports more people, that would suck severity, they terrorize people worse, that sucks. Time frame, it's for longer, that sucks. But then the last one is probability. So how likely is it that if we abolish ICE, a new and uh, more severe form of ICE comes along or versus the likelihood that the small number of productive things that ICE does gets distributed to other criminal justice agencies that already exist, right? So if I was the affirmative facing that kind of argument, that's the kind of impact analysis I would go into, like really looking into the probability that that's going to happen versus the more likely scenario where the small productive things that ICE does just get redistributed. Definitely. Thank you for that.
Um, and of course, the one thing you always got to remember about there's state governments as well that could that could act on their own. So, yeah. is there an issue where the federal government can't solve by just removing themselves because the state fills that that particular gap? And the interrelationship between the federal government and the state governments, and how they act is, as you you will have found out or will find out find out is a pretty uh, can be a pretty large topic of debate. Yeah, and also something that I am probably spring twenty twenty one um, update to the packet might include a state's counter plan, um, just because there is a debate as to whether or not a federal removal of ICE officers and the, deport, the deportation process um, has anything, any meaningful change in how like the sentencing structure of immigration is dealt with in every single state. Um, because it's not just the deportations that are the problem, right? It would be the things that ICE allows for at the level of being able to try uh, undocumented immigrants as, in, within criminal offenses. That stuff that the federal government does has no real effect on how states do. It just says in terms of level of federal crimes. Uh, and if uh, federal agents, i.e. ICE, uh, are able, or I wish I had a better word, but were to, because there's not a better word for it, but were to detain um, undocumented immigrants uh, that they would not be able to detain them just for existing. They would have to commit some type of crime um, in order to do so. Uh, states can kind of renege and redescribe what is a reason for why undocumented immigrants could be tried within a civil or criminal um, way or designation. Uh, we are on what, 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 harms. Okay, negative things that are happening in the status quo that if the plan does not happen, continues to happen. Um, so ICE breaks up families. There's a brutal deportation process and that there are uh, unlawful detention of individuals by ICE officers. This is a line from the evidence in your card. Uh, is that ICE is terrorizing American communities right now. Um, they're going into schools, entering hospitals, conducting massive raids and separating children from parents every day. We are funding those activities and we need to use all the leverage we have to stop it. Um, so this is an example of the, in, like the harm in the status quo that continues to happen because the plan has not passed or at least what the affirmative would say, right, is that this continues to happen and the plan would, would, would greatly stop that. That's the debate whether or not that is what would occur, um, but these are the impacts, the, the affirmative or the harm, the affirmative uh, works to resolve. Significance, necessary insufficient conditions. Now, this was something that I was, that when I was kind of thinking through significance as a young er person, um, what helped me understand uh, significance, but also honestly more strategically had to be affirmative and understand defending a 1AC was the necessary and sufficient conditions test. So um, the, I don't think I, do I write, ooh. So yeah, I, I'm gonna, okay, going in the wrong, I'm going in the wrong direction. Okay, so necessary condition, sufficient condition. Necessary is, is the affirmative necessary to resolve the impact and then also is it necessary that we resolve this impact right now right this presumes a lot of things that are happening in the debate let's say the negative recent argument that the affirmative creates a worse impact somewhere right or that there's this impact that the affirmative causes that has a larger time frame uh, to occur but that the affirmative puts us in a direction of that impact occurring the affirmative would say that even if all these things, right, it is necessary that the affirmative, ha you know, happens and that it resolves the impact because this impact is happening first, right, or the likelihood of it. And so understanding it through a lens of necessary is the F might not be perfect, but it is needed, right? It is why we can only go worse from here slash we should not care about the perfectness 
of the plan, but that we have no choice and that it is imperative that we do the 1AC. Sufficiency is it might not be, it might not have the entire impulse of the necessary condition, but sufficiency is like, you know, the affirmative is sufficient at being able to do the plan, that it's good enough, that it meets all the check boxes to get like a B rating, right? It might not be the A plus that you want, but a B is good, right? If the B holds you, it's, a, it's reliable. And so the affirmative would say that it might not be perfect, but at the level of the ability for it to solve the impact, it is likely to resolve the impact, but also that resolving that impact is guaranteed, it's a, it's a guaranteed uh, impact to occur that should be evaluated probably more so on the probability scale than anything else, but that the affirmative is sufficient at being able to resolve. Um, that competes with necessary because necessary is like, we don't care about sufficiency. Necessary is plan needs to happen now. Like this impact is so bad. Sufficiency takes a step back and it's like, all right, we just think the plan is able to resolve this in a very effective, you know, we have take like, it's not a question of just like not thinking through and not saying that necessary doesn't think through its ability to solve, but that sufficiency is just like, it's good enough. And that should be enough to vote affirmative. So white supremacy would be a impact um, slash a structure uh, that the affirmative is working to combat. And so the question is, does it meet the necessary or sufficiency test? Um, and there's a line from 1AC evidence. All these lines are from cards in your evidence packet. Um, and that is, I reject the racist and outdated premises that we need to treat immigration as a national security threat, that any immigration status should be criminalized, and that any human being is illegal. The fact that Democrats refuse to join me in rejecting these premises demonstrates just how far right our normal is in American politics. So do you think that this meets the necessary condition or the sufficient condition? I will call on people, like, like I told y'all, I'm not afraid. And it's looking like I'm gonna call on somebody probably in the next two seconds. So if you wanna be the one that opens the mic, instead of being surprised and having the mic, I would do it now. Okay, Catherine, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. All right, Catherine, so. The necessary slash sufficiency test. Which one do you think that the affirmative is operating most on? Um, I think it's um, the necessary. Okay, why? Because it's like, it's like stating like it is necessary and I, the other one is like, even though it's like not perfect, but here I, when I read this, it, it's like telling you that it's necessary because of the reasons. Okay, I like that. Um, anyone else want to take a stab slash add some more words to that? Ashley? Um, I also think it's necessary. Um, I'm not like really sure how, but like I think it's because it talks about like how the Democrats like refuse to join um, it just talks about like white supremacy and all, I think, because that's what we're talking about. And so like it is necessary to like get rid of like the racism, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> no, I completely, completely, completely agree with you all. Um, I think that the argument that the abolish ICE AF is going to be kind of brought up against a lot is abolish is too vague, is too arbitrary, doesn't do enough, isn't enough, right? And that the response um, from the affirmative is that even if it is not the most um, concrete, it is imperative, right? Because of the effect and impact that ICE has on society for undocumented immigrants being treated in the ways that they have. Y'all feel me? That makes sense for why the affirmative problem is a more pivot to 
even if not sufficient, i.e. that it doesn't check all the boxes that the negative might bring up in terms of a guarantee for how specific is abolished, how guaranteed and you know, getting rid of all these other additional things is abolished, how does it resolve circumvention arguments? It's like, it doesn't matter. These things are happening and they need to be resolved. We need to do something. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe. All right, Heston. Oh, Heston, <laughs> you're the next person I'm gonna call on, so get ready. Forgot about you. I forgot about you down there. Uh, the, the, for the next one, the next one, don't worry. There's another gonna be another question. And you next, tag, you're it. All right, so. Um, but pause, does the F solvency mechanism meet the test? And so ways to think of the question, right, is, is the plan necessary to solve its impact harms? I've kind of already stated this, but I wanted y'all to see it in question form. Um, also, is the plan sufficient at being able to solve its impacts? So necessary, sufficient. Is it necessary to solve? Do we need the F? <laughs> the, the impact can sometimes be really big, right? Like white supremacy, institutional racism, really, really big. But like, does that mean that the affirmative is the right affirmative to resolve that? Or is the affirmative really riding on the coattails of a big impact, right? Like this impact is so bad, so just ignore all maybe the imperfections of being able to resolve it and let's just like go for it here, right? Is it that the affirmative, not the impact, is necessary? Um, and then the same thing, is it the plan sufficient? And that goes back to more so the kind of um, logistics, right, of the mechanism and how it solves, is it sufficient at being able to resolve the impacts, which makes us question more of like the circumvention arguments or the legal binding arguments that the affirmative will come with. Burden of proof and burden of rejoinder. And after this, I'm gonna pause because we need to get uh, information to um, Maya about who will be in the debates this um, afternoon and then to partner you all up so that you can have partners for the tournament uh, for that tournament sorry round don't need y'all to like oh my gosh her might have signed up for that okay round um, but yeah burden of proof and burden of rejoinder which one do you think the affirmative has and Max you cannot respond to this oh wait I tag somebody Heston which one burden of proof or burden of rejoinder uh, the affirmative, I believe, has the burden of proof. I'm so sorry? I believe they have the burden of proof. And what, um, why? Um, because the AF is making a lot of statements and um, offering a plan, but without proof, there's no reason why we should believe um, that the affirmative plan works or that the affirmative uh, plan is actually like sufficient or necessary. I like it. Yeah. The, the affirmative does indeed have the burden of proof. We'll talk about the rejoinder when we talk about being negative. But here are the things um, that the AF has to, that it has the burden of, is that the AF is more uh, than the plan text and the impact. I can't say the United States should abolish ICE and then go white supremacy bad. I have many questions. I got a many, many questions. How does, what is the affirmative relationship uh, to institutional racism and white supremacy? What is the affirmative relationship to being able to resolve it? How, how does it provide the negative ability to test it? If all you said was abolish ICE and here's the impact, all that stuff in the middle is essential for the affirmative to meet the burden of proof. Next is that debates would be short and lack complexity um, sorry y'all for hearing that. I don't know how to turn off the discord noises, so that's what you're hearing if you hear a little bruh, bruh. Um, Debates would be short and lack complexity and engagement if all that the affirmative had to do was when their impact was the biggest and baddest on the block, all right? Like you said, Heston, there's a lot of questions as to does the affirmative um, solve or meet the necessary sufficiency test how are we best able to know that if all the affirmative is going for is our impacts are really important, but there are many questions. Oh my goodness. Let's see if I just do, I'm gonna, 
I'm gonna mute my computer, not from y'all, but from maybe y'all to hear it. So maybe that worked. Do you, can y'all hear the notifications anymore? Do y'all hear the little bloop bloop things? If I do that, all right, that's my solution. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I can, I've done that, but my, my, how my Discord is set up, I don't know how my Discord is set up this way, but it fights back. It talks to me. I don't know how to make it stop talking to me. Um, it makes noises when I don't want it to. And so, yeah, Nuriel knows about the, <sighs> my talking back Discord. Okay, uh, um, the app has to win slash prove that its solvency mechanism is able to solve for the impact. This includes the, okay, I for, okay, I'm not, actually no, okay, sorry y'all. I, I, I have many computers open, and so I thought that y'all could see the second camera that I have, and that really kind of bothered my soul for a second, but you can't. So now that I'm back and collected, we're gonna try that one more time. The app has to win slash prove that its solvency mechanism is able to solve for the impact. This includes uniqueness. This includes the link and internal link chain of the affirmative advantage. The story between what the plan does and the impact. That's all the in-between stuff that the affirmative has to defend in order to be granted that they have a risk of resolving their impact. Lastly, is does the abolish ICE app meet that burden? These are questions that are central to engaging in the debate. So now All right, y'all. Welcome to being negative. We are gonna go through these things rather quickly not too quick, but also, this is also on YouTube right now. So if you felt it went too quick, there's the slow down version on YouTube where I really kind of sit down, ask some more questions. Uh, I just want to make sure that y'all have time to prep um, and get ready for your debate. Okay. So, this my show. Perfect. See, I even got the ink for y'all. Give you an animation to look at. Get a little excited about debate. Being negative. We love it. We love to see it. Okay, so being negative. As a 2N, it is my favorite thing in America. I used to hate it, but then I thought about it, and when it was almost taken away from me, I was like, whoa, wait a second. <laughs> being the negative is my way to go, and I'm going to explain why in a second. So, Objectives um, for being negative is that students will understand the burden of rejoinder. You just learned about the burden of proof. Now, by you know process of elimination, the negative has the burden of rejoinder. Second is that students will understand presumption and the status quo. Third is that students will review the bottle of negative evidence, which is what we're doing now. Um, and students will not have to worry about all the technical options of deploying the arguments. I cannot stress this enough. This would be a very long lecture if I were to break down how to both deploy and respond to, at the very technical level, all of these arguments um, in a singular workshop. Um, but if you're like, oh no, um, yeah, oh, um, well, sorry. Um, but if you're like, but I do want to learn these things, never fear. That's what bottle practices are for every single Wednesday from two to four for my JV and varsity folks, where I break down these things. And I think next week we'll be doing counter plans um, and net benefits. So both in going for and responding. So if you know, that gets you, your brain excited, I would come to bottle practice. Um, so if you're like, oh, I wish you would have said more on, that gives you an incentive to come to the bottle practice to learn more. But if you can't go to that, it's on YouTube. And if you don't want to go on YouTube, it's in, the, it's in the bottle drive. See how it's like one big system here? Information is accessible. Okay, so I'm going to mute this screen so that y'all don't hear all the notifications that I'm getting because it's a, I work for colleges, y'all. And so something that is happening right now is a big college tournament that I, I am taking a pause at to help lead. But that just shows y'all how ingrained in debate I am. It's ridiculous. So. 
let's get to it. Um, burden of rejoinder. This is the central role of the negative. You have to respond to the, firm, the affirmative. Rejoinder, response, rejoined. A negative that fails to effectively respond slash test the affirmative has not met the burden of being negative. This is different from the burden of proof. Why? Because the F has to defend the entirety of the 1AC. But the negative only has to find, at, at minimum, one thing to blow up. Right, so the affirmative has to prove why the entirety of the 1AC is able to solve for its impact. And they cannot just kind of kick out of it at the end of the debate. Now, I say that with like cringe, cringe, cringe face because there are exceptions to this rule, but we are not in that practice and we are not at that point in our debate journey to be just severing out of the affirmative. Um, but in general, the affirmative is the first and last speech it has to defend the 1AC. That is not the burden of the negative. The negative has to find one thing and be like, nope, the, ne the affirmative is wrong or the affirmative is bad. It does not have to win the totality of the act is bad, but there is something about how the affirmative solves or something about how the affirmative is structured that is bad. Blow it up a little bit and the negative can win. It is the beauty of being negative. You do not have to also hold all of your positions from the 1NC all the way down to the 2 and R. It can come down to just one thing. The AF cannot have the, <laughs> the entirety of the affirmative and only have 30% of the AF at the end of the debate. That's not a good sign. Not a good sign if you only have 30% of your affirmative at the end of the debate. I tell you right now as a judge, not a good sign. Um, so yes, um, reviewing the stock issues from the perspective of the negative solvency the negative ooh no okay the negative can win that the affirmative doesn't solve for its impact i.e solvency deficit circumvention arguments scenario political crackdown so this kind of responds to that question that you had asked me earlier of like are these issues of a solvency uh, debate yes um that there can be like a abolition doesn't solve abolition insufficient abolition doesn't solve for x y and z immigration reform or this in particular violation or the states even, right? Um, and then circumvention is like Trump circumvents the plan. He'll just crack down and pass X, Y, and Z situation, situation in response um, or political crackdown, which is going to be um, just like a, it seeds the political to conservatives to potentially create worse forms of um policies and you'll see that with the dream act um evidence in the one nc case neg is that if abolish ice were to be passed this would mean that conservatives and the equilibrium of having really piss poor immigration policies because we need to have some kind of national security threat and some kind of opposition uh to brown folks crossing the border uh that they'll just pivot to creating a worse um a negative response to a progressive immigration reform uh, that currently exists and that that is bad too. Um, topicality, oh my gosh, the negative can win if the app isn't topical. This means that the affirmative force of the negative to have a debate outside of how the resolution is defined, which is unfair to the negative. We did a lot of the topicality AF neg stuff in the AF um, section, so I'm not gonna really spend any time there, um, but we will be reviewing a lot of these things um, in our bottle practices but there's not a T-shell in the file anyway, so these, that debate won't be happening. Harms. The negative can win that the affirmative harms are either not that big, probable, or of a long time frame. So impact defense, or that the AF can cause the harms to get worse, or that there are worse harms that the plan causes, or, and this is where you're careful, everybody, but I'm going to add it in this lecture, is impact turn, all right? The, in, the app's impact is good. Now, I need y'all to be careful. This impact and this bottle of it, you do not want to say is good because you are not going to sound too persuasive and you will probably be morally questionable uh, if you said white supremacy good. There are people who say that with their chest. And I believe that you are not those people. Um, and please do not put me wrong because I, I put all of my money on the fact that you're not. But an example of an impact turn that is not as morally reprehensible um, is if the affirmative were to say that 
uh, the plan solves for economic collapse. There are definitely debates that are like economic collapse is good because it leads to um, this argument is called DDEV. Uh, it's called D development, and that D development leads to more localized, sustainable ways of living that we're unable to ever kind of move towards because we're so, you know, controlled by the markets and so controlled by like capitalism that economic collapse kind of cre or um, breaks down, burns down those kind of institutions and obsession and forces us to have a more localized um, perspective on living. And that's good because it resolves things such as the environment, right? So like the carbon footprint that comes with like large scale corporatism um, or factory production wouldn't be as uh, bad because the argument would be that everything is localized. So things would like your neighborhood, like farmer's market, think like neighborhood farmer's market everywhere right? Like there is no longer a Kroger's or Safeway or Whole Foods. Now it's just like folks tending to the land and having better, more sustainable practices that we need to, the economy to collapse in order to get us there. So that's an example of an impact turn. That debate is an interesting debate that happens that people love to just de-develop. Um, but that's the less not more moral or reprehensible argument that could be an impact turn. Uh, stock issues, Oh my goodness, my math is so sensitive. Uh, that the stock isn't continued, is inherent. See, we talk about this, remember? The app has to win if the plan isn't happening in the status quo. If not, the negative can win a presumption argument that the app is in the world right now. So maybe I should stop, pause, and talk about presumption for a second. So the negative always has the status quo as an option, right? So if the affirmative does not prove a reasonable departure or change from the status quo, it means that you can, it means that one, when you vote affirmative, you are basically voting for no change. And if the affirmative is structured to provide a change, but they have not proven how they are any different from the status quo at the level of their ability to resolve their impact, it's like you're voting for the status quo anyway. So because the affirmative does not have the status quo as an option, you vote negative on presumption because the negative will always have no, do nothing, or AF has not met burden of proof. With me? No, yes, kind of. Give me some Zoom reacts. Give me no Zoom reacts. Sure. Okay. I'll, I mean, I'll take, I'll take sure. Sure. Sure opens the door a little bit. Um, who's sorry, looking at messages. Okay. Huh. So yeah, I'm going to take sure as like, we feel it enough. Okay. So, uh, blah, blah, blah. oh my goodness, y'all. Significance. The negative can win that the app's impacts aren't that important or if the F isn't big enough to resolve its impacts. This goes back to the necessary insufficiency condition, as well as uh, goes back uh, to this idea of the affirmative has the burden of proving that they are able to solve for their impact or that they are a meaningful change uh, in the status quo. This is important when we think about impacts, like how the affirmative has, because I don't think any affirmative in this world could ever claim that it solves in its entirety for white supremacy, right? Or its entirety for institutional racism. There's not one policy that can ever do that. And I think that we all can agree that on that, there's not like a one policy done, all racism gone, all white supremacy gone. And that shouldn't be the mantle that the affirmative, um, uh, what is it? That should not be the mantle of the negative has, or the affirmative has to defend, but that's why the affirmative will say, you know, we're good enough, like we should, da, da, da. and the negative will say, well, the affirmative isn't big enough to resolve it, and so there's this balancing act of how much does the affirmative have to win, and how much will the negative kind of push that further and further out, where the F has to win a, a higher, higher amount of uh, F solvency to um, solve for the impact. And that's what the negative does. The negative loves playing the 
I want to, I want to see how far I can take this. I want to see how much I have to prove or push the affirmative to have to win their solvency. And that sucks for the affirmative. You're like, I can't win that I solve all white supremacy. Negatively, of course not. But we'll just argue that you don't even solve 10%. And for some reason, the, the negative will say, you got to at least be 30%. And I can be like, we think that 10% is fine, especially if that 10% is the fact that folks get deported, right, um, forcibly, uh, and that institutional racism is bad and should be rejected in all instances, right? Um, so it just is that debate that happens. Uh, evidence. We are not going to zoom through, but in honor of not having this for the affirmative, um, we will get through in ways that y'all can still have some time to prepare. Also, you have a break to prepare too. So it's not like after this, boom, you're, you know, actually, no, that is what's happening. JK, so yes, I'm gonna help y'all off case. We got the reform counter plan, the internal H HSI net benefit, and the settler colonialism critique, as well as the case net, but that is off, that is on case, not off case. Um, so the first thing, reform counter plan. The counter plan text is that the United States federal government should end arbitrary immigration enforcement by one, reforming immigration laws to change all immigration crimes into civil offenses, and two, directing the HSI to focus immigration and enforcement solely on criminals and national security threats. There's going to be some like pushback from the affirmative on this um, in terms of what are solely criminals and who is seen as a national security threat. And by maintaining the larger agency of ICE, are they able to make a more uh, specific search engine uh, to what a real criminal is versus all undocumented immigrants uh, being seen as criminal? Is that possible? That debate definitely takes place. Um, but how does this counter plan compete? Let me move all these little text options. Uh, one is the advocate for the CP text. I'm not going to read the entirety of it, but the larger kind of point of it is that instead of abolishing ICE, um, it would rather abolish the um, ICE, uh, the office, it would abolish the program that focuses in on unlawful detentions of civilian undocumented immigrants, right? It would redesignate um, any offenses to being civil. And so therefore, they've not broken any kind of rule of their visa status um, or non-visa status because they will have to win, they will have to have done a actual serious criminal offense. And that is where the counter plan goes. We can redesignate that to things such as sex trafficking, drug smuggling across the border, et cetera, et cetera, which means that the likelihood that undocumented immigrants are coming on or that are detained is reduced substantially because there's no longer any legal backing because there's no law uh, at the criminal level that was broken. That is the logic of this counter plan. Um, and also that there is a program, HSI, which is uh, right here, HSI, um, is a predecessor of the um, ERO, which is the Enforce Enforcement Removal um, Operations. Um, it has a long history with border operations and um, drug contraband and smuggling and large-scale uh, sex trafficking um, across the border, that they are a kind of a task operation and helping to um, both securitize but also crack down on those serious criminals and that it's important that that agency stays existent. Uh, but Jasmine, does abolish ICE get rid of HSI? Yes. Um, I will show that slide in a second for where the evidence says this. But reform versus abolish, that's the debate. Do we reform immigration customs enforcement or do we abolish it? Right? What are the pros and cons of abolish versus reform? Is abolish ICE the necessary starting point to comprehensive immigration reform? Is HSI effective? 
The counter plan goes all in and says, the reason why we should reform is because HSI is effective in being able to crack down on serious criminals. Is HSI effective then if this is what the counter plan is going all in on as a justification to not abolish? Um, and these are all questions that are central for the counter plan debate on both the affirmative and negative side. Um, the internal net benefit the, this is that the plan would result in the termination of HSI. Net benefit is what does the counter plan not link to that the plan does? Um, and therefore, that is how the counter plan competes. You always need an internal net benefit, but like I said, or you always need a net benefit, but uh, all that kind of stuff will be dealt with in a bottle practice where I break down counter plan theory and strategy. Um, so come to those. But the, uh, the card says that ISIS Homeland Security Investigations Division, HSI, um, is sent a letter to the Secretary of Homeland Security proposing that their division be split off from the rest of ICE. So already it's creating this kind of, we are different than ICE. ICE is the problem, not us. They argue that the actions of the Enforcement and Removal Operations Division, ERO, uh, those are the guys who bust down doors, have become so controversial that they are harming the entire agency's reputation and undermining other law enforcement that agencies willing us to cooperate. So this is HSI being like, we're not the bad guys here, okay? ICE is, ERO is. Uh, but does that mean that the plan gets rid of um, HSI? Yes, because they are commingled. That, that's the reason why that department is making a claim to be separated from ICE just in the event that it were to be gotten rid of because they're now they are put together. They're like, do not combine us. We do not want to be combined. This card, all in your evidence, goes uh, longer to describe things that the HSI uh, works towards investigating at a security end as well as intellectual property rights, money laundering, and um, a lot of the things that I talked about above, about drug smuggling and uh, sex trafficking. Um, so there's that. And then that's the counter plan. We're moving a little quick. I apologize. We just have a very, very quick timetable. But um, I will always be here to answer questions, um, model practices, but also via email. So the settler colonialism critique. Huh, this is where I'm like, huh, because this is by no means a argument that I can just break down in five minutes, like, right? Um, so I'm here to provide you just kind of what is the argument being made uh, in response to the affirmative. So the K makes the argument that the world is situated on a settler colonial foundation that produces power through ownership of land, bodies, and labor. Um, there is a historical foundation for this argument. Um, sorry. Uh, there is a historical foundation for this argument that is specific to the U.S. formation. This is important for terms like native and Indian. Um, and if you are non-Black, do not use this phrase in regards to settler colonialism because it's talking about a racial uh, formation. And I know that there, like, and the reason why I say this is because there is parts of the evidence that are not highlighted, of course, but just when you're reading it and you're like, I want to re-underline or re-change it up, um, just be cognizant of your non-Black or non-Indigenous um, position um, in reading this argument that we should think of power, think of how it is spoken into existence, and think of our positions in relationship to that power. Um, so I just wanted to add that in there just so that we can start that conversation. Um, like I said, this is such a uh, robust and deep thing that takes some time, and I'm gonna have an entire series on the settler colonialism critique throughout the next, like, for like, it's gonna be like a two or three week series so that we're all just on the same page. Uh, but I'm not going to tell um, black and indigenous authors not to use phrases um, in their literature if they want to use that. That's, it's up to the people who are consuming it and using it for scholarly purposes to be cognizant. Um, so yeah, uh, I will break this down at the level of how does this operationalize itself um, in debate. So what is the link argument that this critique has to the affirmative? It would say that the, the affirmative is an act of redress or another act of redress. 
that operates through ceding land, authority, and ownership of power to the sovereign, the sovereign being the U.S. This is bad because it leads to the perfection of settlement and produces ongoing impacts of genocidal logics. This is where I'll stop and do like a quick like, here's the moment. Um, so y'all are all familiar with the good, well, not good, not good. I'm just speaking at the, in a vacuum. Uh, not good, uh, but 1492 um, and prior to 1492, this idea of conquest and what came with conquest of the Americas um, was the seizure of land, was the seizure of bodies and the bringing over of bodies non-consensually, right, to produce the U.S. settlement, right, and that these ideas of punishment, these ideas of citizenship, these ideas of rights um, and security uh, were built and perfected through systems of settler colonialism because we first had to produce a settlement, right, produce a civil society, um, that the government could be built uh, in its foundation on the mores, the, the, the morals and ethics of why protecting settlement is good, why are rights good, why is citizenship good. That required folks who did not meet those categories to create categories for folks that could. So that kind of ability to control bodies, to capture bodies, and to create an entire system of value or entire system of ethics and morals about protecting and securing the settlement and sovereignty are a genocidal project because it required literally, you know, uh, native genocide and the captivity of black folks from uh, Africa. I'm sure all of y'all are familiar with the slave trade um, to build um, the settlement. And so now you're like, okay, so what is the relationship between that and now is that there is always that relationship because at no point has the United States ever been dismantled, deconstructed, broken down, but always readapted, um, always kind of securing the walls of settlerism or securing the walls of sovereignty, and it operates through these same value systems, these same ethics and morals that only understand citizenship, only understand rights, only understand humanity even, through a lens of who is able to be kind of productive and protected within settlement. Those folks typically are not your brown black people, because the brown and black people are what kind of create those walls for who is considered human, who is not considered human, how are, like, what are the, what are rights, right? How do we, like, like the right to, what is it, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? That was not a right given uh, to uh, black and brown folks because they were used and needed to create a category of humanity. And I know you're like, oh my gosh, this is going like, this is like, what? I know. This is what I'm saying. This is going to be a series. I'm trying to break this down in the most kind of like historical, but also explaining the socio-formative event um, that is settler colonialism and how the affirmative relies on redress. Basically a negotiation with sovereignty. It's like, hey, give us our rights hey, recognize value, recognize that folks shouldn't be detained, recognize, you know, black and brown uh, folks not being seen as security threats. Why are they seen as security threats in the first place, right? All of these kind of um, formations were perfected uh, during settlement, and that settlement has never ended. Genocide has never ended because genocide is not just solely the eradication of bodies, but it's the eradication of culture and presence and the ability to um, present one's existence into the world and not through a lens of kind of stereotypes, tropes, um, and outdated um, discourse on rights and citizenship, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the affirmative is just another act of redress that allows for the sovereignty to continue, right? Um, and so the other link argument would be that the act is a reform, not abolition. Um, and so it's like they have said that they abolish ICE, 
but they do not abolish the method or they do not abolish the ways in which um, immigrants are always seen as a security threat, but rather just kind of create some better like legalities or words that sound really cool and radical, but that do not structurally change the way in which black and brown folks are viewed and then seen as um, a threat. And I see Maya's note, so I'm gonna take three more minutes and I'll provide y'all with some time to like do lunch prep, talk to your partners and things like that. So I do apologize y'all, y'all feel this is quick. Uh, this is just like one of those things that does not take two seconds. Um, but I will say, uh, da, 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 please do not, it will be very annoying if they end this Zoom call. Please do not do that. Okay, so um, yeah, C recommendation, counter plan critique, choose one. Do not read both in the one and see. They contradict a lot, all right? So the one and see will either be the counter plan in the case neg or the critique in the case neg. And if you're unsure of why they contradict, just think of it this way. You have said reform is bad on one flow. And then you are advocating that reform is good on another. On a very, very simple, I'm not even gonna add in the, all the, you know, the bells and things. That is why you should not do that. Because the affirmative will be like, okay, so which one is it? Is reform good or is reform bad? Yes, there are, like, there's negation theory, but once again, we're not there. We're not doing all that stuff right now. Pick one, don't contradict. Uh, and so then the alternative is to burn it down. So no, we do not negotiate with the sovereign. No compliance. When we negotiate, it opens up the door for being controlled, for being influenced to compromise with the state that we have to be willing for a radical project of insurgency and refusal to negotiate with the state because only then are we able to kind of break away from the accepted norms, norms that are settler colonial and anti-Black, right? To get to a true resistance to institutions. Um, case neg, and this is where it's, we're back to like, okay, things that I can parse out and think through simply. One is that the negative wants to problematize the absolvency. Af of abolition not sufficient. Trump circumvents the plan. Two, is the negative wants to use case turns versus the affirmative to prove why doing the affirmative uh, causes worse things to happen. Remember when I brought up the, all right, so this plan happens, but um, this means that uh, conservatives, or this sees the political to conservatives to deferral on the DREAM Act because uh, as anything, folks want to be reelected, right? They don't want their constituency to think as though they're being progressive on immigration. And so if this plan were to pass retroactively, this would mean, this is not necessarily true. It's just like there, there's evidence, right? That this would just mean if any kind of uh, liberal uh, reform were to be made, this would put pressure on conservatives to uh, redact or to go back on the DREAM Act. And the DREAM Act is what allows for students uh, students and second generation uh, folks of uh, immigrants to have citizenship status and that uh, deferring on that would mean that that also is a bad immigration policy or that would be a negative uh, stance on immigration that would probably maybe lead to the affirmative impacts because it now means that folks get deported. Um, three is that the negative should apply impact defense or internal link defense. Uh, either uh, AF does not solve for impact or abolition um, uh, fails, uh, or that you know moratoriums or whatever that the uh, solvency evidence is of the 1AC, the likelihood that that has any effect on comprehensive immigration reform would do. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts as to kind of what this means if you're going for the counter plan versus if you're going for the critique. But presently, all the things that are in the case, Neg, you can say regardless of reading the counter plan or the critique in the one NC, um, because you're just making arguments for why the affirmative doesn't solve or why uh, they create worse things to happen. And that's consistent for both arguments. Like you can also say that the affirmative just causes worse things to take place and also be like the affirmative relies on settler colonial foundations that only make things worse. 
the case that would just prove how you make things worse, right? Like deferring on the DREAM Act would mean that it makes uh, lives for immigrants um, uniquely worse than the status quo, and that is bad. Uh, and another thing is that not all of these things does the negative need to have. You do not need to read everything in the case net. You just need some things. And as we work through our bottle practices, we will think more strategically about what parts to include and what parts not to. Um, and this includes any analytic arguments or arguments that are not cards. I highly recommend, right, making arguments that are just you keeping up to date with like the news or kind of thinking through how to um, make your own insights into the debate 100% on the, both the affirmative and the negative side. Uh, and then five, that think through the off case and make sure that case arguments are complementary and not contradictory. And I just said that above. You want to make sure that you're not double turning yourself is the phrase for that. You don't want to say reform good on one page and reform bad on the other. It does not go too well. And it's kind of awkward. And then you kind of have that cross X moment where you got to be like, so you see what I meant was, and that's just not, the gentleman no. The app is to choose. They'll be like, yeah, reform is bad. Well, then the affirmative could kick out of the app and be like, the negative has to defend it, but the negative, yeah, it's a whole, I'm not even, I'm not going to do that. Um, so yeah, that is the presentation. You all have um, lunch and then from there, the debates. So talk to your partners. Thank you so much, um, Harrison and Promote for being here and adding some insight to help the students. I don't know if you have any final things to say to them before we close out this uh, workshop presentation. Nothing more, Dad. You did a really good job, Jasmine. Um, I'm looking forward to judging mm -hmm. your all. Are y'all leaving me on? Are y'all leaving me on red too, or is that just y'all don't have anything to say? <laughs> oh wait, no, because my mic is muted. Sorry. Now I can hear if you are saying things. <laughs> gotcha. No, I'll say it. I think you did a good job, Jasmine, going through everything. Harrison might have more to say as well, but I'm looking forward to judging practice debates as well as um, competitive debates later this season. I'm not going to be available this afternoon, but I'm sure I'll be uh, seeing all of you around either on Zoom most likely on zoom sometime in the future especially for that tournament coming up in october or later this month we're already in october so I'm looking forward to that yeah thank you very much jasmine this was super informative i learned some stuff too um and so just as a quick message to the students in this space you know i just coming from i know at least one of my debaters here is a freshman and it's going to be their first tournament and everything so if you're like kind of new or you're looking at all this like, wow, that was a lot, that's okay. This is everything you just saw was a result of years and years and years of competitive debate experience. And a lot of this stuff is something that you'll internalize with experience. So don't put it on yourself to have mastered all of this or like totally understand what's going on. Go to practices. And the best way to get that experience is to actually do the debate. So you'll get a chance to practice whatever you're comfortable with today. So thank you all for sticking in and hanging tough.